I was asked to speak about understanding health across the life course at a high level and uh, to point out ways in which data would need to be understood towards informing us how health is produced over the life course. So I want to start with um, a couple of comments about how to understand population health, broadly speaking. And uh, I'm going to do that by showing a cartoon to start. Um, it's a cartoon from uh, On a Plate, which is a series from New Zealand. And uh, this is um, the way to follow this is two panels, panel on the left, panel on the right. And it says on the left, this is Richard, his parents are doing okay. This is Paula, her parents not so much. Richard's house is warm and dry, shelves are full of books, bridge is full of food, Paula's house is full of people, damp and noisy keeps getting sick. Richard's parents will do anything for their child and so will Paula's, that's why they're working two jobs. Now Richard goes to a great school, his teachers love their job, Paula's school, the classes are large and underfunded. So we can see why expectations for Richard, where his parents say B plus, we need to get you a tutor, are different than those set for Paula. B, hey, that's not bad. And over time, of course, Richard's parents are paying for university. Paula's working and juggling her polytech and getting in debt. His dad puts in a good word for him, gets him an internship while her dad is sick. And each little difference sneaks by unnoticed. His loan is approved. Her loan is not approved. And Richard starts to believe that he's achieved what he's achieved by his own success. There's this cartoon that says, Roger's boy, right? I'm keeping an eye on you. And then we see a party, which is uh, where Richard is being congratulated for some achievement for which no doubt he worked very hard and Paula is now serving food and Richard I says the secret of success is less whining more hard work I'm sick of people asking for handouts no one ever handed me anything on a plate which of course she is now why am I showing you this I'm showing you this because anybody watching this um, webinar will recognize that this is all entirely true entirely right but it really makes the case I think this cartoon about how advantage accumulates over a life course, a small little piece of advantage right from the beginning that fundamentally are advantages of the luck of the lottery at birth it really had nothing to do with anything Richard achieved. There are many metaphors on this. It's like sort of starting from second base, third base. Um, um, and uh, and that, that doesn't obviate the fact that Richard did a lot of hard work. It doesn't obviate his own individual behavior. It simply says that we cannot understand his behavior, his achievement without understanding his whole life course. And similarly, we cannot understand the health of Richard and Paula over time without understanding their whole life course. So I think this perspective, the life course perspective, is foundational to understanding health in populations. When I go down to populations, I'm going to go to a schematic. If one thinks of a population like this as a series of uh, these gray figures, what we're trying to do in, in, from a health perspective is understand health in populations, which are the dark blue figures here. And we really are trying to understand health populations and how that health is generated over the life course. And we want to understand that so that we can actually make some people who might be sick healthy, prevent them from getting sick. This is a different approach than an approach that focuses only on a subset of people who are typically patients in a clinical setting. So we are trying to understand health over time in whole populations. When one thinks of it that way, from my perspective, there are two core conceptual framings that we need to think about about the production of health and populations, which I think inform then what data we get and how data lends itself to answering these questions. Those are a life course perspective and an eco-social perspective. A life course perspective might look something like this. This is modifying from a paper, but what it says is you have age here and then here you have development of poor health. Different stages in life, prenatal, infancy, adolescence, adult life, older age, result in accumulated risk. In prenatal, it's mother's nutrition, mother's access to care. In infancy, it's separation from parents, exposure to violence. Adolescence, social support, discrimination. In adult life, employment conditions. Older age, social isolation. Genetics do matter. They continue to matter at a baseline level. They don't really change much over time. But fundamentally, we accumulate risk over the life course, just as Richard and Paula accumulated their life circumstances over the life course. So that's model one. And I think when we apply data to understanding this, we need to have under apply data ideally at all of these stages over time to understand health. The eco-social framework is, tells us it's not just about me, it's not just about how I progress over time, but it's also about the world around me because my health is influenced, yes, by my genes and by my behaviors, but those are influenced by my social relationships, my living conditions, my neighborhood where I live in, the institutions I live in, the social and economic policy. So this is quite a tall order, quite a tall order for data to come to inform a life course perspective and an eco-social perspective. But once you understand this, that this is what causes population health, it becomes difficult to see how we can understand population health without 
applying data to understand both the life course perspective and the eco-social perspective. Now, what I wanted to do is very quickly, in a couple of minutes each, talk about four key concepts that I think emerge naturally from the understanding of health being produced by the life course, being produced into an eco-social framework, and us needing data to inform all of these con uh, all of our understanding of population health. Now, I'm picking four concepts. I could pick many, but I think these concepts are central, and they are central to how we analyze data and how we think of and understand population health. Number one, population health and the data used towards it are continuous and not binary. Now, this sounds obvious. It's perhaps the most obvious of all principles, but I think it's critical because in health, far too often we think dichotomously. We tend to think of health as being sick or not sick, binary. But health is continuous, particularly in populations. There's a classic population a normal curve, looking at distribution of body mass index. And all I want to show you here is the distribution of body mass index, which is exactly as you would expect it. And then the cutoff, the BMI cutoff at 30. If we are looking only at the prevalence of people who are obese, we're looking over 30. If we look at the whole population distribution, that is quite a different picture. And in fact, when we look at how the country's weight has been evolving, I want to show you the data from NHANES National Survey in um, 30 years ago, I guess 40 years ago now, and then just 10 years ago. And what you see is this shift in the population distribution. So while we frequently talk about obesity being to the right of the line, which I realize has been shifted a little bit on my slide, um, and we talk about the increase in the absolute prevalence of obesity, which certainly you have here, the increase in prevalence, but the whole population has shifted and that everybody now carries a little bit more weight, which of course, all of that accumulates risk over the life course. And a life course perspective says that we want to take data that follows things over time so that we can actually understand how those pieces fit together and result in this shift of distribution over populations. And this, of course, informs how we may intervene to improve population health. Because if you take a, an approach that looks only at dichotomies, you can take what, what Jeffrey Rose called a high-risk approach, which means you take an approach where you simply intervene for people who beat the cutoff. A population approach that recognizes the production of health over the life course and recognizes the ecosocial forces that bring health to a fore in individuals as part of populations will then ask how can we intervene, not just at the individual level, but also at the social network level, at the neighborhood level, at the community level, at the policy level, to shift whole populations, to shift the distribution. And that is only visible when you realize that data are distributed in populations continuously. If we are to look at distribution of data across populations informed by a life course and social perspective, we need to understand that many of the causes that we're interested in are ubiquitous and often invisible. I want to show you one concrete example of this. This is uh, the, um, in the mid-80s, there was uh, a lot of talk about crack babies all the time, which is uh, moms who used uh, cocaine while they were pregnant and then the consequences for their children. And uh, of course, there was a sort of there's a lot of talk about that, but eventually studies emerged that actually showed that over time there wasn't much difference between the children who had gestational cocaine exposure and control, that's the gray versus the white, on developmental metrics, despite the fact there was a lot of talk about how this may affect these children. So further studies are done and showed that the reason there was no difference is because there was a difference in these babies, but it wasn't due to gestational cocaine exposure. It was because of environmental stimulation that these babies were all born into poor environments and really stimulation poor, not just acid poor, resource poor, which was a ubiquitous factor. That's what shifted their curve. They were, they were predisposed to be doing poorly. They were being set up by their life course to do poorly. And our data needs to capture that. If we only focus on gestational cocaine exposure and the outcome, we are going to miss much more important things, which is the overall context within which these babies were born. I could tell you a more concrete example. We talked about the shift in our obesity, which is of course a central risk factor for non-communicable disease. And we could talk about what is more ubiquitous now, which is more calories in our environment. Bagels used to have 140 calories. Now they have 350 calories. Plato pasta used to have 500 calories. Now it has a thousand calories, etc. This is the ubiquitous force around us that over time, over the life course accumulates in the generation of the health of population. Part three, uh, point three, predicting populations, not individuals. We, we are in the middle of right now as we're taping this of the COVID pandemic. There's been a lot of talk about predicting and predicting what happens. It's very difficult to predict what happens to individuals. We're much better at predicting what, what can happen to populations. And that is a simple function of 
population level data and our statistical tools. And that of course has real implications for then understanding that when we're talking about life course, we are trying to predict life course population health, not life course individual health. I'm gonna show you this from a paper published um, uh, in the Framingham study, which is um, run by our, my institution. Uh, this looks simply at the um, cumulative incidence of diabetes and genotype score. And uh, what you see here is that the higher genotype score, the more diabetes there is in the population. When you see something like this, your inclination is to say, well, I wonder what my genotype score is. I wonder where I fit in the likelihood of diabetes. But of course, this is a population level uh, observation. You can also take that same data, look at the same genotype score, and look at people with and without diabetes. And what you see here is that the curves of people with and without diabetes very much overlap. So at the population level, while a genotype score of 18 may mean people are much more likely to have diabetes than not, at the individual level, knowing you have a genotype score of 18 doesn't really change very much, does it? And that is very much a fundamental reflection of how data can be used at the population level and how it becomes very difficult to discriminate over the individual level simply because the production of health at the individual level is highly complex and involves full sets of variables that are often beyond the scope of what we're looking at at any one point in time. So prediction is much more useful at the population level than at the individual level. And the fourth point at the population level, thinking about the life course perspective on our health, is that we need to be thinking about health overall and health gaps. And often there are trade-offs between overall health and health gaps. And if we're going to be thinking about applying tools to understanding the health of populations, we should have the wisdom to recognize that those tools are telling us things about overall health achievement and less or perhaps something different about health gaps. This is um, simply a, a reminder about the widening income related inequalities that we have in uh, this country at the moment. This looks at uh, birth cohorts of people born 1930, people born 1960. This looks at what the life expectancy was at uh, for the poorest quintile versus richest quintile then and then for people born in 1960s. Now there's a 13 year gap people born in 1960s while there was only a five year gap people born in 1930s. So inequality in our health is growing. It is a central feature of the health of our population in this country. And to my mind, it's one of the biggest challenges that we need to face in health. However, it is important to remember that that is, has to be considered in concert with overall population health. And the two frequently are jarringly in juxtaposition and may even be in contradiction. Um, um, inequality among women. Only the richest quintile of women have actually gained in uh, life expectancy in the past 40 years, while well, all the poorest 80% of women have not gained. All really making the case for the importance of inequality. But now let's think about how we can improve inequality, how we can improve overall health. Supposing we have a situation where you have, um, in a no intervention situation, you have an inequality of 25 DALIs, that's disability adjusted life years. Suppose you intervene in such a way that uh, everybody, that, that you get one DALI to per 50. That's not unreasonable. You, you create an exercise program where people, of course, who are already in reasonable shape can now exercise. While people who are in poor shape, they can exercise a little bit less. You can improve overall health. As you can see, the average here is greater than it is here, but you've widened inequality. Look at another version where you're adding 10 now. You have 10 here, you're adding five here. You've improved overall, but you've increased your inequality. Let's talk about another example. Suppose before the intervention, things were equal. Well, you can intervene in a way that uh, people who are, have more access to power, wealth, and resources are more likely to get the intervention, which is always what happens. This is why we have things like digital gaps. This is why we have things like intervention gaps. Overall, we may have improved population health, but we may have resulted in more widening of health gap. Now, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm simply saying that these are realities of how health is produced over the life course and a data intensive approach, which is what we should be taking, needs to recognize both overall health and health inequities in order for us to be able to inform society in making difficult decisions. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to conclude with just this one slide. This is a, a picture of my pet goldfish. And uh, the reason I show you this is because when we think about the goldfish's health, we may think about telling the goldfish to exercise, to swim around its bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times clockwise every day. We may ask it not to eat too much food, to be careful for its weight, to reduce its risk factors for chronic disease. And all of that may be fine, but unless we think about the goldfish's water, the goldfish is never really going to be healthy. Health produced over the life course across multiple levels is an example of the goldfish in the water bowl and why we need to think about the water. And I think that is why 
I was glad to be part of this because anything that highlights thinking about life course, thinking about life course in multiple dimensions, multiple levels of influence, and then applying data and methods to understand data so we can understand the production of health in that vein is going to be a positive for our capacity to understand population health.